So, first of all, thank you all very much for the opportunity to come and speak this morning. Um, it's actually four years since I stood before a CETA group and talked about building information modeling. And this morning, I'm going to show you what we've been doing recently. And I'm going to go back and, and do some verbally, some comparisons of what we're doing four years ago and what we're doing now. In four years, a lot has changed. And in four years, nothing has changed. So the challenges that we faced four years ago are still the challenges we face today. The, the interesting thing is there's more and more people who know about BIM. But the real question is how many people are actually doing it and getting value from it. So the 90% reaction to the CETA survey is a valid reaction on, on, on an international scale. Everybody knows what it's about. People have done the training. They know what the software tools are. But how many people are actually getting value from it? That's the real question. Um, I'm a family man. Very proud of my family. This is my wife and my son. Um, for those of you who are on Twitter, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm, to be honest, where I live in Asia, Twitter is not very popular. Um, we use LinkedIn, we use other things. But if you are on Twitter, you'll find me talking about BIM and other things on Twitter. I've got my whole life for the last 20 years has been around 3D construction, 3D digital construction. So I've spent the last 13 years running my own company, promoting and advocating the use of BIM in Asia. And over those three, 13 years, we've completed something in a region of over 100 different projects across pretty much a global scale. So we've, we've seen projects in Australia, New Zealand, we've seen projects in Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore. We're currently working on a major project in Malaysia, which is using UK standards for BIM, which is quite interesting. And we've done projects here in Ireland over the years. And we've also got, because of our parent company, we've got a number of projects we're doing in, in North America. And I'm going to show you one of our biggest projects in North America as part of this morning's presentation. So talking to Alan Hoare and the team at CETA before the presentation, they wanted me to share with you my experience from overseas and just to let you get a sounding board for what are people doing in, in other countries. On all the projects we've been involved with in the last three to five years, we go back and do a survey and we talk to the owners, we talk to the architects, we talk to the engineers, and we get some sense from them as to what we can improve on the next project. And I believe in continual learning. If you're not going to learn from mistakes, you're not going to get very far. They all have the same sentiment. They wish they'd started doing BIM earlier. They see the value. They, they understand the value of having the design in 3D. They understand the value of having the information available to them. And they just wish they'd started doing it earlier. But what they find is when they start specifying BIM, so when a client starts specifying BIM, and I'm going to show you the airport authority as an example, they have one expectation, but then they get a completely different outcome. And very often, the expectation is that BIM is going to solve a particular problem. Whether that problem is uh, lack of drawing coordination between disciplines, whether that problem is lack of certainty around pricing and costing and, and, and quantity takeoffs, whether that problem is around certainty in the schedule, certainty in the program. They think that by specifying BIM at the beginning of the construction process, the client's going to get a better outcome. What they discover is the specification of the technology tends to shine a very bright light on the failures of the processes on, the, on these projects. So where we have fundamental concerns about how architects, engineers are communicating, sharing information, exchanging information, BIM highlights that very quickly. So if you've got uncoordinated, we find in Asia, I'm not sure, I'm sure you're all going to tell me, it's every, all the jobs here are perfectly coordinated, we don't have problems. But in Asian contexts, the design is never developed before we start construction. So we're basically going to design, we're going to site a 60% completion of design. And we find lots and lots of problems on the job site. So BIM highlights those problems but doesn't necessarily provide a solution in that instance. So I'm going to share with you some examples of that kind of thing. I sat down yesterday in the train coming up from Sligo, and I tried to figure out what would be the four, three or four key points I put across this morning. And I think the, the four things I landed on, having looked at all the different things we've worked on over the years, what are the drivers for this? And are the drivers different in Ireland to what the drivers are in Asia? And I believe they're the same the world over. The drivers tend to be client drivers, the drivers tend to be the contractor's driver, and it eventually becomes the consulting engineer's driver. But it tends to start with the clients or the contractors. And then my bone or my kind of pedestal I'm standing on the moment around BIM is training education. Uh, I know a lot of people here are involved in sharing about BIM, sharing about knowledge, doing training. But we as an industry are pretty pathetic about training people. So we actually don't bring up people and bring skill levels up the way we should. And part of that is around competitive fee tendering. Part of that's to do with staff attrition. Part of that's to do with the cycle of the economy, where in five years' time, the whole thing's going to go, go, go down again. So why would we bother training people up, et cetera, et cetera. So training is a huge issue. And in the last, certainly the last year, 
and more specifically the last six months, it's becoming very, very clear that the big, big players in Silicon Valley, the Googles, the Apples, the Intels, they're looking at the construction industry in a very different light. And they're looking at what's happening at the UK around data requirements, this Kobe drop system, site capturing of information, laser scanning, UAV photo photogrammetry, all of these new technologies. The technology sector in the US is looking at our construction industry going, we can make some serious money in this. So it's attracting in some very, very interesting and some very powerful new technologies. And then certainly last but not least, uh, we had a conference call yesterday with the speakers. And one of the key points is, what, what do we do about legislation or regulation? How do we actually, do we follow what they're doing in the UK? Is there an example that we can follow from Singapore or Hong Kong? What, what are people doing? And my opinion is legislation takes too long and it's an ax that shouldn't necessarily be wielded, but we have to start doing this and self-regulating. So having the Association of Consulting Engineers involved, having Enterprise Ireland involved, et cetera, et cetera, that's a step in the right direction. In terms of an opinion, I think we should be following the UK standards, the PS 1192 standards. I think we should be looking at the, 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 the ideas that have set out in those standards, the vision they've set out in those standards. And I think in Ireland, it's an obvious no-brainer that's what we should be following. So a couple of couple of kind of questions I'm going to pose and then hopefully resolve in the presentation. In terms of engineers, when we speak to consulting engineers, the first thing they do is they say, well, I'm going to use a tool like Revit or Archicad or Tecla or one of these products because I can improve my own productivity. I can improve how quickly I can produce drawings. I can often improve the quality of the drawings. They can actually then use the models for better coordination between disciplines. So if you've got a, a structural engineer, a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer operating in BIM, you can generally develop the design quicker and more thoroughly. And I think the font's gone a bit mad. You can also use it obviously for visualization and presentation. But what we're finding is if, it, if it's instigated by the architect and the engineers on their own, then it basically gets handed to the contractor, but there's no value to the client. So the real challenge is how do the clients specify and get value from this whole proposition? And, and again, what we're seeing is clients who've specified BIM for clash analysis are now going, we're not getting the value. It didn't, it didn't solve the problems we thought we would. Now we're going to use the PS1192 and we're going to try and capture the data. And what, we're going to, what you're going to see, in my opinion, in the next three to five years, is lots of clients are going to get lots and lots of information, lots and lots of data, and then they're going to go, well, what am I going to do with this? So the next, the next challenge is going to be, what are we going to do with all this information that we're going to get from this process? So the main thing we're seeing is it's actually been driven not by the clients, but by the consultants. These are two of my own team in Hong Kong. This is Queenie and Roger. Queenie's my accountant and Roger's one of my technicians. And I've used this slide basically, Queenie's trying to chase Roger for some information about billing so we can actually get money from one of our clients. But the purpose of this slide is to talk about training and education. I don't believe that we actually have enough competence in the industry. I don't believe that enough people have been trained to enough depth of knowledge that we can actually do this efficiently. And I think we're all making the same mistakes over and over, over again. So the way we're using the technologies, the way we're exchanging information, the way we're sharing information with the contractors, the way we're getting access to the contractors' information can all be done better. And I think, and I'm, I'm talking about an Asian perspective, and hopefully some people in the audience will disagree with me, which would be great. But in principle, I don't think we actually have 90% capability. I think it's far, far short than that. We have 90% awareness, but I don't think we've got 90% capability. Um, how are new technologies going to impact our worlds? This is one of my uh, these screens are hard to see at this angle. This is this is uh, Gilbert and his dad, and his dad is wearing a virtual reality headset called Oculus Rift, and he's doing a construction safety training module. So we're using virtual reality to do construction site safety training, and we think these new technologies cannot be ignored. So virtual reality, augmented reality, laser scanning, even 3D printing, they're all new technologies that we have to figure out how to get into our workflows. And last but certainly not least, this is a snapshot of a cover of the Construction Industry Council in Hong Kong, not the Construction Industry Council you're aware of. The CIC in Hong Kong have actually created a roadmap for BIM for Hong Kong. And as part of that roadmap, we've created a building information standard. Now, living in Hong Kong, they have to have their own, they have to have their own version of everything. So they've got their own concrete codes, which are the same as BS810. They've got their own steel codes, which are the same as the UK standards. They've got seismic codes, which are from California and some from Beijing. And they have to have BIM standards, and they have to have the Hong Kong BIM standards, which is great, but they're all based on PAS 1192. So the whole Hong Kong system 
is actually a very true reflection of what's happening in the UK marketplace. So it's the same roadmap, it's the same logic, it's the same process, it's just called the Hong Kong BIM standards. So in Hong Kong, the government will not legislate for the use of BIM. In Singapore, the Building Construction Authority, for a comparison, has mandated that all government projects must deliver models and data to a BIM standard, which again is very similar to the UK standards. So, so there are the kind of key, four key points. One is around the, the use of BIM, why are we doing it? Another is around training and the need for more training, which I'm going to shed some more light on. And then the third key point is obviously the use of technology. So I'm going to show you two or three case studies to highlight some of the issues. And these are jobs that we've recently completed. When I was here four years ago, one of my slides indicated that there was a major airport terminal starting construction in Hong Kong. That terminal is now complete, and we've learned quite a lot of lessons. Hopefully the video works. There we go. So this is Hong Kong International Airport. It's actually a reclaimed island on the west side of Hong Kong City. The steelwork was designed by Arabs, working in conjunction with Mots. And this is the construction site. There's 19 bridges for 20 aircraft for this terminal, so it's a major international terminal. It can cope with the A380 in multiples. Inside the building is an exposed ceiling, which is a triangulated, curved ceiling, which proved to be very entertaining to build. And here you can see it, the access to the hoist. There's also some tensile fabric. So, so that's just a flavor of the project. To give you some details, it's 100 something square meters. Oops. Excuse me. So it's a million square feet of space. Um, the skylights are north facing, and they were part of the problem, and there's 20 parking stands. So it's a very, very long building. It's 700 meters from end to end. If you stood it on its end, it would be one of the tallest buildings in the world. The cross section is relatively simple. You've got the airfield at the, the bottom, at the ground level. There's no basements, there's no underground structure in principle. You have all of the airfield facilities at the ground level. You have an arrivals level, which has got a lot of plant room space. And then you've got the departures level, which is the open air exposed environment. So this is the actual construction model, and we term this an LOD 400 model. Um, I'm hoping that some of you will understand the difference between LOD 300 and LOD 400, but if you don't, we can take questions. And this is, this is where it goes horribly wrong. My brother is here, he's an architect. How, how many people here are of, of an architectural profession before I start slagging you all off? Okay, great, so I'm, I've got to be very careful what I say next. Um, on this project, the architect shows a profile for the roof which is actually a, the, the same profile as the wing of a plane. So it's not actually a barrel roof, it's actually a continually changing geometry. And they've created a fantastic interior space, but they've created a very complicated construction process. So lessons learned from this project. The airport authority specified the use of BIM at the beginning of the design process. So when they commissioned the architect and the engineer, the architect and the engineer signed up to a contract where they had to deliver BIM. So they had to actually design the project using BIM processes. And what the client said was, you must do it, they written, wrote in the document, you must provide a 3D clash analysis model. You have to cover the entire project. So all areas of work have to be designed in 3D. All the building services, all the airport systems. And the objective was to identify as many clashes as possible during the detailed design phase, demonstrate that they were resolved, and then maintain the models, excuse me, and then hand them to the contractor. Now, that all sounds fantastic. The one flaw in that specification was that the owner, the airport authority, didn't specify that the consultants had to generate their drawings from the models. So what, we, what happened was the consultants did not commit to doing Revit or Archicad or Tecla or any of those things, except for the roof geometry where they had no choice. But the rest of the building was all documented by traditional 2D means. So all of the e &M systems were documented in 2D, all the structural concrete was documented in 2D, and all the internal systems were documented in 2D. And then they took all that 2D information, gave it to a BIM shop in China, and generated a 3D model to give to the owner. So basically you had a scenario where the design wasn't done in two dimensionals, and then there was a th separate 3D model. They met the objectives of the specification, they delivered a 3D clash analysis model, but every time they changed the 2D drawing, the model was immediately out of date. So by divorcing the two, they had a huge problem. So the learning the airport authority have had is that for the next project, they're going building another runway, they're going building another airport terminal because Hong Kong is crazy like that. They don't, two international runways is not enough, we need a third one. The third runway program is all going to be based on level two BIM from the UK. 
and ACOM have been given a contract to write all the BIM specifications to make sure that the next terminal is designed and documented using BIM processes. So there's been some very good learning by the airport authority. On that project, the roof was designed using some very, very complicated algorithms and some very complicated whiz-bang software, but they unfortunately didn't detail the roof because it was a design and build component. So the onus was left in the contractor to develop the details and the documentation and the design for the roof system. So the architect generated a surface which dictated the actual top level of the roof, and it was dictated by the air traffic control tower. So the air traffic control visualization over the roof to the aircraft was the design criteria. And from that surface down, the whole roof had to get detailed below that surface. Arabs produced the steel model, and they produced a primary section model only. So I don't know what's happening in the Irish marketplace, but in the Asian context, the consulting engineers do not do connection details, they don't do secondary steel details, they don't do cleat details, they pass all that down to the contractors. And in so doing, they, they basically don't do the detailing at the design stage, and they wait for the problems to occur on the construction site. So that's the difference between a fabrication model and a design model. The fabricators were using Tecla, and Arabs were approving the Tecla models as part of their process. But when we started doing the detailing on the construction site, we started to uncover some very, very complicated problems. The first thing we uncovered was that people had overlooked the maintenance requirements. So you have this roof, which is spanning 30 meters across the arrivals and departures of an airport. It's stocked full with fire sprinkler systems, calm systems, air conditioning systems, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to get to. And the walkways, which are these purple blocks, are threaded up and down through this roof. Unfortunately, when we started doing the detailing, you would have to be about yay tall to qualify as a maintenance engineer to work in the airport to be able to move between the trusses. So I definitely will not get a job working in the maintenance department at Hong Kong Airport. We've solved most of them by reconfiguring the walkways, but the modeling showed one key issue. There wasn't enough detail done at the design stage, and these problems should not have been discovered halfway through the construction phase on site. And this is, I'm not sure if this is just an Asian phenomenon, but this is the problem of going to site at 60% design. We had not actually resolved some very, very fundamental challenges. And then when you get to the roof system, the roof system was made up of prefabricated cassettes. So we'd actually fabricate the actual cassettes on the, on the ground and hoist them into the air. The cassettes were also detailed in Tecla by the subcontractor for the roof system. And then they were then covered with a standing seam roof. So there was a lot of exchanges between the subcontractors, one subcontractor doing the Tecla steelwork detailing and the other subcontractor doing the, the detailing for the cladding system. The challenge was, if you were the cladding contractor, your program and your milestones are much later than the steel contractors. And the main contractor started to learn very, very quickly that he actually had to get the, the roofing contractors on board with the resources, with their staffing, with their engineers, with the detailers, before they could complete the steel detailing to identify cleat locations, to identify bracket locations, et cetera, et cetera. Even though the fabrication drawings were not needed for the roofing system for many, many months, they had to bring them on, on board earlier. And that was a very interesting learning for the main contractor in terms of they, they call it best if managed. So BIM, is the, their acronym within Gammon is, is best if managed. And what they mean by managed is managing the subcontractors. When do they have to start doing the work? When do they release information? How do you control the information, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're on site, one of the things that we've learned over the years, and I think I probably made this point when I was here the last time, you have to have the team on site. So for this major project, we had a dedicated construction site office and there was hundreds of people in the office, but the BIM team was one key component. So Gammon Construction were the main contractors. Gammon appointed our firm as the BIM managers, so we were on site to manage all of the, the interfaces. And what we term management is very important. We're not doing the modeling. So basically, each of these circles is a subcontractor. So the cladding system, the curtain wall system for the envelope was done by a company called uh, Condo and they're a, a Hong Kong Chinese facade company. The ceilings were done by a company called Colmat, which is a Korean Hong Kong company. Craft projects to the roof cladding system. And then Gammon have their own steelwork division, so they did the steelwork in-house. And last but not least, all the building services, or E&M or MEP, depending on which vernacular you're used to, were all done by Gammon's own subcontracting division on the E&M side. The team of people required to deliver that project involved technical managers, BIM managers, coordinators, engineers, and ultimately modelers and technicians. All up, 
at the peak, we had 70 people working in BIM on that project on the site, doing anything from pipework detailing to steelwork detailing to cladding detailing. And just managing that team of people alone was a task unto itself. And to do that, we attempted, and I say we attempted because we failed, we attempted to use sophisticated project planning techniques using Primavera P6 and the like to actually plan out all the activities for the BIM team. So we had a schedule which identified when contractors would submit their models, when if those models would be audited and checked, when the coordination workshops would take place, and then allowed time for revisions, amendments, and, and then basically two iterations of detailing coordination. All of the milestone submissions had eight to 12 weeks windows to get the work done across many, many subsets of the project, and they were all back tied into the contractor's deliverable schedule. So the key driver was predominantly the concrete structure and the steelwork structure. So all the milestone dates for those, those structures drove the BIM delivery program. Now, it all sounded great at the beginning of the project, and we all had dates and everybody signed up to it, but it all went horribly wrong. And it all went horribly wrong because the mechanical contractors, they had a different program, they had different milestones, they had different payment terms, which were much, much later. So basically, they did not provide the resources when we needed them. So again, the learning in that project was, while we got it all done, ultimately, we should have had the NEP guys on board earlier. They should have been incentivized and paid earlier to have the engineers, the staff available for the project. Instead, they did it in a traditional contract where they didn't need to produce shop drawings until halfway through the project. So they didn't have engineers available at that point in time. So while we had a BIM program, it proved very, very difficult to actually implement. And as a result, this is just a pretty picture of the site. That's the actual model. As a result, one of the things that we struggled with was builder's work drawings. And again, in Hong Kong, the builder's work drawings or the um, wall elevation drawings are done by the site works team. So they're actually done as shop drawings by the contractor staff. They're not provided by the architect. They're not provided by the engineer. They're actually done on site by the team on site. Our plan was to use the ductwork, cable trays, pipe work to drive the ENM coordination and produce all the builder's work drawings. If I have a pipe in a model, I can automatically put a hole in a wall. If I have 10 pipes crossing a space, I can automatically populate all the holes required for those pipes. And if I do that, that's fine. If I build that wall with those openings, that's fine. But if those pipes then start moving around, you're going to be spending a lot of money on coring because the holes are in the wrong place. So to be able to use the technology to do the wall elevations, you have to have a frozen mechanical electrical layout but if you don't have the engineering resource on the job, and that's not frozen, you can't generate the wall elevations. So it's one of those, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You'd like to use the models to produce the drawings, but you know that you're going to have to start doing coring. Funny enough, anybody who's in the coring game in Asia, they're all driving around in Mercedes and BMWs. Coring is a very lucrative business. I'm sure, I'm sure nobody makes any money coring in this country. Um, you can produce drawings. Anybody who's seen BIM, we know we can produce the drawings from these tools. But if fundamentally we haven't got the processes right, and this is what BIM keeps throwing up, if we don't have the processes right, we can't get the value out of the proposition. So we did the wall elevations based on the information we had at the time, and the contractor took basically a, a gamble that he would do less coring, but he knew he'd still be doing coring. And one of the funny anecdotes, the, 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 the CEO of that construction company, Gammon, is a gentleman called Thomas Ho. And Thomas is a very, very strong advocate of BIM for construction. And he knows me personally, and we've done a lot of work together over the years. When he would do his, his Saturday morning walkthroughs in the construction site, as they were nearing completion, there were still guys on gantries coring. And Thomas turned around to his site foreman and says, is Ronan paying for these? Because Thomas's vision is that if the BIM is working, he shouldn't have people on site coring. So when he sees people coring, he knows there's something not right in the process. Now, he's not blaming us, but he knows that the BIM process hasn't been what it should have been. Now, I know Leica are here this morning, they're not, going to like, they're not necessarily going to like the next slide. Um, one of the things we learned in this project is the value of laser scanning. How, how many people here have seen or used laser scanning on, on their projects? Okay, about a third of the room. I can guarantee you by this time next year you'll all have seen it. Okay, if you haven't seen this technology already, by this time next year you'll all have seen some version of it or have some exposure to it. Laser scanning is ultimately going to change the way we survey buildings, both during construction and existing buildings. It is A, quick, it is B, relatively cheap, but more importantly than all of those things, it's safer. 
And when I say safer, when we started scanning the site at midfield, we had to scan the barrel vault roof. We had to get a survey done of the underside of the steelwork to complete the detailing for the ceiling system. And when you've got a ceiling which is partially complete on site, the only way to get to it is either on cherry pickers or put guys in harnesses to hang them out the steelwork or do laser scanning from the deck. So you don't have people actually at risk at heights falling, and obviously you're at risk of falling. So my big, big sell on laser scanning is safety. It is a safer way to scan and survey buildings. One little anecdote about this slide, if anybody's worked in a construction site, you can know instantly that that's a very inefficient site because there's so many ceiling panels missing. There are 900 different types of ceiling panels in that roof. Some of them are left out because of sprinkler heads. Some of them are left out because of comms. Some of them are left out because they couldn't find the right panel at the right time. And the actual installation of that ceiling is actually very, very difficult. So the architects who are using Rhino and Dynamo and all these fancy things, we need to get the architects to understand that they need to rationalize these designs down. 900 panels across a 700 meter roof is probably over the top. 100 different panel types would have been nice, but 900 is probably pushing it. So this is a laser scanning. And for those of you who've never seen it, a laser scanner is basically creating a point cloud. And if you tune it the right way, you can get points at three to five mil in terms of the spacing. You can get them right down to one or two mil if you like. And they're extremely accurate. So you can pick up cleats, you can pick up brackets. In these examples, you can see the wheelbarrows starting the site, you can see the safety railings, etc., etc. And because it's relatively quick, you capture this data once and you can use it for multiple, multiple things. Now what we discovered was, and this is where the learning is, if you combine laser scanning with LOD 400 models, in other words, fabrication models, so the model that you use to fabricate the steel, if you then survey the steel and overlay the data sets, you actually get a very, very quick appreciation of where the steel is in tolerance, where the steel is out of tolerance, where there's potential issues. So a lot of people start the world of laser scanning as we call it scan to BIM. They go into a space like this, they scan the room, and then they have a bunch of guys trying to make a Revit model based on the scan. That's actually very, very inefficient. It works, but it's very inefficient. When you actually have the model, and you're using it for construction, and you can laser scan in an afternoon, and overlay the, data, the point cloud on the model in the same day, you unlock a huge potential value. And the speed at which we can now scan accurately and safely and verify what's installed on site is incredible. And what's interesting is we don't do the scanning. So let me just show you. This is a fixed link bridge. So in case you, in case you don't have organic architects doing fancy curvature, we also do this for all the normal structures. So this is a rectilinear steel truss prefabricated in China, shipped to site in a barge, hoisted into position by a crane, and then had to be clad on site. And when we scan this, this is the video of the scan. So this is actually multiple scans. So we've got, captured in this video probably 30 scans. And the keen eyes, you'll see the, the white spheres. They're the actual survey targets. So this is a 3D point cloud scanned on the job site. And it took the team, I think it was about four to five days, to scan that entire structure. Now, the advantage is we can use the point cloud over and over and over again. So we can measure trusses, the truss distances, we can measure verticality, we can check cleats, we can check the, the, the relationship between the steel and the concrete, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have to keep going out there with measuring tapes and total stations to survey. And again, when you overlay the point cloud on the steelwork, the reason we did the link bridges was to make sure that the cleats were installed within tolerance and wherever the cleats were out of tolerance, we informed the subcontractors to amend their details, shop details, so that the purlins and their fixings would accommodate what was on the job site. Again, trying to speed up and reduce the works on site. So the laser scanning, the one key rule around laser scanning is if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I need to get this technology, do not go out and buy the equipment. Okay, Go to a surveyor who has got the equipment, they're registered, they're licensed, the equipment is calibrated, they know what they're doing, and get them to survey your job. And do three or four jobs, and then start to see is there value in you then acquiring the technology. Because in Hong Kong, the surveyors are actually independent from the contractors. They're not, they're not on the contractor's team, they're separate companies. So our organization, we don't do the laser scanning. We employ qualified, licensed surveyors who've got calibrated, registered equipment, and then we get the accuracy. What we've seen is the contractors go out and buy these things, 
they cost a huge amount of money and then they never get used because they don't know how to use them. The guys go back to their total stations, et cetera, et cetera. So my one lesson is if you're sitting there thinking, I need to buy that technology, don't. Subcontract it. Get somebody who knows what they're doing and get them to do the surveying. And I believe there's probably two, if not three companies in Ireland who are actually doing the surveying. So make use of them. <coughs> Building services. How many people here are involved in mechanical, electrical, or E&M engineering? You guys are the number one target for the guys who don't know what you're doing in BIM. Every time I go on a project, all of the e &M guys have got no idea. They've got no idea how to put in pipe work. They've no idea what they're doing. And it's not true. But for some reason, the building services fraternity seem to be the, late, the later guys to the party when it comes to BIM. If you're involved in concrete and steel work, you've probably been doing 3D modeling for the last 15 years anyway. But if you're doing pipe work layouts, ductwork layouts, cable tray layouts, you may have only just come to the party recently. And in Hong Kong, up until recently, we would actually provide a service where we would take 2D information and generate 3D models, and we would find problems, we'd point the finger and say, that's not coordinated, that's not fixed. We've now moved to the point where we're telling the contractors, we will do the coordination for you. We will do all of the site coordination as a service to the contractors. We will produce all the E&M models. So this is a project that we're working on at the moment in uh, Hong Kong. And I'm running out of time, so I'm quickly going to jump through some of these slides. So this is a, a 3D model of a podium structure, which is a mixed-use podium structure. And we've linked that model back into the building fabric. So we've got an architectural model, structural model, and an E&M model. So historically, we would make that model and then run a clash analysis report, and then we either tell the consulting engineer they had a problem, or we tell the subcontractors they had a problem. That was a tradition, that's a traditional BIM consulting role, make the model point the finger. We've learned that doesn't actually work. You're not actually adding any value. All you're doing is refereeing, and referees are the most hated people on the pitch the last time I checked. So what we've decided to do is we've decided to get our hands dirty. So we're now actually doing the engineering and the coordination, and we're rerouting pipe work, we're rerouting duct work, we're rerouting cable trays, and we're generating proper, fully coordinated, fully detailed e &M systems. And from those systems, we're ensuring that they're coordinated with structure, architecture, that they're maintainable, they're accessible for facility management purposes, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're using the models. So here's a simple example. This is a corridor alignment that we've coordinated. And we're using the models to explain to the architects where they have to make changes to the ceiling layouts or we're proving that we can actually do the coordination within the ceilings. And going back to the wall elevations, because we're controlling the models and we're doing the engineering of the models, we're driving all the wall elevations. So we're putting openings in the walls and we're putting them in once and then we're done. So we're not moving around the pipework. And if we do, we know which openings have to be fixed. From that, we're producing what we call CSDs. I guess you produce them here in Ireland as well, but we call them, in Hong Kong, they're called combined services drawings, which is basically a technical term for layering lots and lots of CAD files on top of each other. I prefer to call them coordinated service drawings. So in our business, we're producing these CSDs. So we have sprinkler layouts, ductwork layouts, cable tray layouts, et cetera, et cetera, builder's work layouts. So the model is driving the 2D documentation, but the engineering is in the model. All the coordinations in the model, all the engineering, all the discussions, all the interactions. And it's all on site. So the team doing this are actually on the construction site with the trades, with the subcontractors, day in, day out, workshopping, solving problems. And the thing that we couldn't figure out for years was if the model is correct and if the drawings come from the model, how do we make sure it's built correctly on site? Because anybody who's been on a job site and tries to control a fire sprinkler subcontractor or an electrical subcontractor, whoever gets on the job site first wins. If you walk into an empty construction site and you're putting up pipe, you're going to put your pipe in straight lines from A to B and you don't give two shits about the other guy. Excuse my French. But then that screws up an entire process. So what we're doing, we're taking laser scanning and we're laser scanning the project week by week, install by install, and we're actually supervising the site installation. And then we're taking the laser scans and we're overlaying them back on the BIM model to make sure the pipe work is as we engineered it, the duct work is as we engineered it. And where it's not, we very, very quickly demonstrate to the contractors the scale of the problem that they potentially have. So if the pipe is installed in the wrong place, if we can work around it, we do. But in this case here, where the pipe work and duct work are installed too low, you have a major problem with the future ceilings. So we basically can identify very, very quickly, very early on, before we start hanging ceiling frames and ceiling systems, that that ductwork has to be reconfigured. 
so we can get the guys on the job site to fix it pretty quickly. Once the guys on site realize how quickly we can do this, they then start paying a lot more attention to what information we're giving them in the first place because they know that we're going to come and survey it within a couple of hours. So it's very interesting the psychology change in terms of up until now they were getting away with it and then they'd be given a change order and they'd be paid to take it down. Now we've actually somewhat changed the rules of the game. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to speed this up. Excuse me while I jump into the slide for one second. Um, everybody here has heard of 4D, right? Anybody here a sports fan? Any, any, any NFL sports fans in here? No, I didn't think so. <laughs> We've got one. The only American in the room. And the NFL basically is one of the biggest builders of major structures in North America. And they're currently building a new stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. And we got involved in the project through our parent company, Can-Am. Can-Am are doing the steel fabrication for this project. Um, I don't have the numbers with me, but to give you a sense of what we're doing, we're using a 4D cycle to actually plan out the erection of the steelwork. And we're doing it because when you erect these major stadiums, the challenge is you have to lay down all the steelwork in the actual stadium sports dome, and then you have to lift these trusses up into space. These blocks are representing the trusses that go, get installed. The blocks, in some cases, are over 600 tons, and they're getting lifted by some of the biggest cranes in the world. But every time you assemble the truss in the ball, you have less working space, then you have a crane problem. So what we've been doing, oh, there's noise on this one, hang on. So this is a time-lapse system. So you can see the cranes assembled inside the bowl. What we're trying to do is we're trying to preempt all this planning. So we're actually doing every single move of every single crane, every single truss, and it's done week by week on the job site. And the reason I've brought this up for today's presentation is I want to show you something that this actually has got some cool music to it, hang on. How many people here have heard of DGI? UAVs? How many people have used the UAV? <coughs> Few. Every construction site in Ireland within three to five years will have one permanently on site doing UAV photogrammetry surveys. This is a UAV footage of this project. Oops. And while it's a cool factor, what the contractors have realized is that if you UAV scan a job site every week, it wins hands down when you start doing progress reports, delay claims, delay planning, etc., etc. Instead of site photographs, you have basically got a 3D, you can create 3D models from these, these things, but you've got a 3D video from elevation of your site. So you don't need a helicopter, you don't need to get a plane to fly by. You get a UAV which fits inside the size of a laptop case, and you can send it on a predetermined path, and you can fly that path every week. So you can have basically week on week on week records of your construction site using UAV technology. Of course, when the guys see the camera flying around, they all start waving the camera, hey. But this, this just shows the scale of this project. These, these trusses are 100 feet tall, and they're spanning 250 meters. They're, they're colossal pieces of kit. Now, last couple of things. Um, I mentioned earlier on virtual reality, and I mentioned safety, which is one of my, one of my key things. We're using Oculus Rift. Oculus Rift is owned by Facebook, and they have these virtual reality headsets. Google have a thing called Google Cardboard, so you can stick your phone on your face. It's the same impact. But what we're doing is, and we're working with a company in Australia, a company called Newton Lowe in Australia. Newton Lowe have developed a, a system whereby you create a construction site. In this case, this is a Hong Kong construction site. And you put, deliberately, dangerous conditions in the job site. So it might be working at height. It might be moving obstacles, moving cranes. It might be a lack of guardrails, et cetera, et cetera. And then you basically put the virtual reality goggles on senior foremen. The guys who know how to find and prevent accidents, the guys who've been on job sites for the longest period of time, they put on the goggles. And they basically go around the construction site and they identify different constraints. And they've got in the room 10 or 15 trainees, and the trainees get to see, oh, that's what the senior guy's doing. And then each trainee then puts the virtual reality goggles on. The, the game system has changed slightly, so the, the dangers are manipulated, so they're not exactly the same as previously, but they're all still there in terms of welding at heights, guardrails, etc. And then the trainee has to find all these conditions while all of his mates are watching. So all of a sudden, 
you're bringing people into a real, a virtual, real construction environment. And while people talk about VR for architectural fly-throughs and getting the client to see how the bathroom is laid out, I think this is huge. Being able to actually take a BIM system for a construction project, generate a site-specific training tool that you can use for construction site safety training, and then develop systems and results out of that training is very, very important. And the guys in this company are looking at eye tracking software, they're looking at motion tracking software to figure out how are people actually identifying these, how do we improve people's recognition of safety hazards, et cetera, et cetera. And what's proved interesting in Hong Kong is while we started doing this with the contractors, the insurance companies have picked, up their, picked it up and going, hang on a second, what's this all about? How can we use this to improve and reduce accidents on site? So if the insurance companies start paying attention, you know you're onto something. So in wrapping up, because I've only got two or three minutes left, I know we started a little bit late, but um, I have got, hopefully, shared some experience and some ideas. I have spent, in the last six months, I've been in Singapore, I've been in Kuala Lumpur, I've been in Seoul and Korea, I've been in Hong Kong, I've been in Macau, and obviously I'm here today. I've been around Asia quite a lot recently, and it's the same in all those different cities in terms of what's happening. They're all looking at PS1192, which is going to become the European standards, which the Americans are going to adopt under the Building Smart fraternity, which the Chinese are going to adopt in mainland China. Everybody is following the same logic, the same data structures, the same processes. So whether you're sitting there going, well, maybe we should do that, maybe we should do this, from my experience, both from our organization and also working with the Hong Kong government, it's become the benchmark that we're all going to follow. So that's the, if you don't know about it, that's your first point of call to learn about the systems and the data. I make this point every time I make a presentation. We need to train, educate, and inspire more and more people about these technologies. I volunteered to come here this morning. I contacted Alan Hoare a couple of months ago and said, look, I'm in Ireland for three weeks. If you want, I'll come and do a presentation. I love getting an opportunity to come and talk. And I love sharing what we're, what we're doing on projects. So hopefully, if a few more people step up and do this, we've got some good speakers here after me this morning, more people will understand the pitfalls. And I don't like overselling this, because there's too many people hyping this up and overselling it. People need to learn about the mistakes, about not scheduling things properly, not getting the contractors involved early enough, not doing enough detailing. These are the key issues that we're facing. And last but not least, if you're not looking at virtual reality, laser scanning, even 3D printing, and even augmented reality, which is the next generation of technology, it's going to come and it's going to appear in your workplace very, very soon. So again, the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks, they're all looking at it. They see our industry as a huge opportunity, and they're going to come and play. It's going to be really interesting to see what they do. So hopefully you've all taken something out of this morning's presentation, and all that's left for me to say is thank you all for your time this morning. I appreciate it.